So this is a second video on introduction to the finite difference time domain method or the FTTD method. I'm Shan Hui Fan from Flex Compute. In the last video, uh, we gave an introduction to the basic idea of the FTTD method and show that you can generate a very nice movie visualizing how electromagnetic wave propagate inside uh, a vacuum region. In this video, we're going to take a step further and to show how you can use the FTTD method to get information that you usually care about in device design. And here we're showing a particularly simple example where we're going to try to get transmission spectrum through a dielectric slab. In our example, the dielectric slab is made of silicon with an index of 3.5 in the infrared wavelength range and with a thickness of half a micron. We will be sending light propagating normally instant upon the silicon slab along the z-axis and uh, try to compute the transmission. For this simple system, the transmission spectrum can be computed analytically. And shown here on the right is the analytic results. What we like to show you is how to reproduce this analytic results with the finite difference time domain method. And in doing so, illustrate some of the additional thinking and perhaps subtleties about the setup of the FTTD method. So to start in any FTTD simulation, the first thing that you need to do is to set up the computational cell or the computational domain. So uh, in our case, we will put the silicon slab in the middle of the computational domain. We will add some free space below and above the silicon slab so that we can accommodate the source and the monitor on either side of the silicon slab. So in our case, we choose about 1.5 micron, which corresponds to about one and a half wavelengths of free space below and above the silicon slab. In the XY direction, we choose the size of the computational domain to be two micron. For this problem, it is an overkill. Uh, in fact, because the silicon slab is uniform in the X and Y uh, dimension, uh, you can, in fact, choose a much smaller computational domain size, maybe even 0.1 or 0.2 micron would have worked. However, uh, in the next video, we're going to use the same computational domain uh, to simulate a photonic crystal slab structure, uh, which has more complexity in the implant direction. So the XY uh, dimension here uh, is chosen, uh, in fact, with a future calculation in mind. We would discretize the computational domain in terms of E cell. And in our case, we choose a discretization uh, so that each grid uh, corresponds to a uh, linear dimension of about 10 nanometer. And that turned out to be sufficient to get to the accuracy that we need. As I mentioned in my uh, last video, uh, for any finite difference time domain simulation, you will need to choose the boundary condition that truncate the computational domain. In our case, we put perfectly matched layers along the Z direction, and these are artificial absorbers used to absorb instant plane waves to simulate an open structure along the Z direction. In the XY dimensions, as I mentioned, the slab is uniform. And therefore, we put in periodic boundary condition as indicated here. These periodic boundary conditions are useful for simulating structures with infinite extent interacting with an incident plan wave. Now, let me comment on the source. So source is used to excite the electromagnetic field inside the computational domain. In the FTTD simulation, it consists of distribution of oscillating dipoles on a plane in our case. And we will have all the dipoles to have the same magnitude and oscillate in phase, in phase in order to set up an incident plane wave. One of the very important capability in FTTD simulation is that you can actually set up a pulsed source 
so that you can get a broadband response of a given structure. In other words, the response of a given structure over a wide range of frequencies in a single simulation. In our case, we set up a source amplitude in time so that the current actually oscillate at a carrier frequency, but has a Gaussian envelope in time. And this is the corresponding spectrum of the source. You can see that with this particular time dependent source, the spectrum cover a frequency range of about 100 terahertz around the 300 terahertz carrier frequency. So in this case, we are using a pulse source to generate a broadband input in order to determine the response of the structure over a broadband width. To determine the transmission, we look at the electromagnetic fields on the monitor plan on the other side of the slab, and we compute the pointing vector plus flux that pass through the monitor plan as a function of frequency. So uh, this allows us to compute for a given source how much power is actually transmitted on the other side of the structure. To convert this into a uh, transmission spectrum, however, we also need to figure out the amount of power or intensity that's in the instant wave. So therefore, in many of these simulations, we typically do two calculations. In the first calculation, we would do use exactly the same computational domain with the source and the monitor, but without the slab. So we're simulating in vacuum, and we look at how the uh, pointing vector flux look like on the monitor plan as a function of frequency, and the, that give us the blue curve. Then in the second simulation, we repeat the calculation by putting into the slab, and the pointing vector flux spectrum in this case then give us the red curve. Once we have these two curves, we can divide one against the other to get the transmission spectrum. And that's shown on the bottom here. You can see that the transmission spectrum, in fact, looks very nice, especially near the 300, nanometer, uh, 300 terahertz frequency range. It's very smooth. But near 200 terahertz or 400 terahertz, you can see something strange that's going on here. This comes about, in fact, by analyzing the uh, incident wave spectrum as indicated by the blue curve. You can see that at 200 terahertz or 400 terahertz, you are really at the wing of this incident spectrum where the power in the instant wave is very small. In this case then, in fact, you will not get very reliable data about the transmission simply because there's not enough power in the instant wave at those frequencies. So to fix this, what you would usually do is to choose a pulse that's narrow enough in time so that its spectrum can cover the entire frequency range that you are interested in. So in our case, if you narrow the temporal duration of the pulse, you can get a source spectrum as indicated by the blue curve here, which now covers a broader range of frequencies all the way from 200 terahertz to 400 terahertz. And again, repeating the calculation with the slab and take the ratio of these two, you get a much nicer transmission spectrum as indicated here. And you can see that the curve uh, in this case, a lot smoother, uh, especially at the wing of the uh, instant spectrum, for example, from 200 terahertz to 400 terahertz. You can compare this result that you obtained with the analytic results. So in this plot, the red curve is from FTTD. The dashed line here is from analytic results. And you can see essentially perfect agreement between FTTD and analytic results. And in this calculation, 
with a single calculation, or in this case, two calculation, because we are looking at both vacuum and the slab with two calculation, you in fact can obtain the behavior of the structure over a broad range of frequencies. In this case, all the way from 200 terahertz to 400 terahertz, and therefore a 200 terahertz bandwidth around a carrier frequency of 300 terahertz. So uh, this, of course, is a relatively simple FTTD calculation. But if you are interested in learning FTTD, I would strongly encourage you to actually go through the calculation with the script that we provide. Uh, I think you will learn a lot on how you actually go about set up the FTTD simulation and some of the thinking that's behind it uh, in order to get reliable results.